Hello everybody, Dr. Schaffer speaking here and I will share some more chapter 14 information with you. Uh, on the next slide here you can see we're still in chapter 14. Chapter 14 covers two topics, IR or infrared spectroscopy and then mass spectrometry which we also abbreviate as MS. So we need to understand what kind of mass spectrum uh, we're using um, and the ranges, the numbers that are in there. It becomes very important for us to understand the role of what's called a radical cation. Uh, in a mass spectrometer, a molecule is being bombarded with high energy electrons. So one electron goes in and then knocks out another electron. And that's why we now have an unpaired electron. So that gives you the radical nature. And because an electron is missing, which every electron carries a charge, we now are dealing with a cation, okay? Uh, it also becomes very important for us to understand um, uh, arrow pushing formalism. Uh, so when you're looking here, uh, this now has to do with, um, we have a curved arrow that moves two electrons, but we also have what's called a half barred or half hook arrow. And really, I've underlined it here and put it in red, only one electron moves with that. So very often we have to either draw one or an odd number of half hook arrows to understand the electron movement. Uh, the other thing that we're discussing are molecular ions um, or parent ion, and there, there's different terminologies. So there's M, and then because there are isotopes for certain atoms, we also are dealing with M plus 1 and M plus 2. And then uh, one thing that's uh, probably the more challenging aspect has to do with uh, how do we understand fragmentation patterns and then um, understand how these uh, radicals and cations form. Uh, caution here, in the spectrophotometer, we only detect the cations, not the radicals. And often the bond can break either way so that each component can have one time a, a radical character, but in the other time a, a cation character. And it's going to become more clear as we work through some problems. Um, the unit that's, that we're using is uh, we're getting masses. So this has to do with simple numbers, you know, one for hydrogen, 12 for carbon, uh, so on and so forth. Um, Another important um, uh, component in your mass spectrum is uh, known as the base peak. This is usually the peak that is set at 100%, and we'll look at some examples. Where it becomes more uh, challenging uh, when we look at specific fragmentation patterns. So those are called alpha cleavage, which can happen uh, in um, in alcohols as well as amines as well as and then also dehydration. Although there's there's an additional fragmentation pattern that's called the McLafferty um, rearrangement, and we'll definitely cover that in more detail when we get to carbonyl compounds uh, in a few chapters. On the next slide, so here. Um, we are typically determining the molecular mass and molecular formula. So how many carbons, hydrogens, might there be an oxygen in there, might, be, might there be a nitrogen in there? And then in the, in the mass spectrometer, so the specialized instrument, um, a compound is vaporized and then ionized. Um, and there are different methods for this. And then basically it falls apart, which we call fragmentation. Uh, we can now detect the masses of the ions and then graph them in a spectrum. Uh, please note that you often get clusters of, of peaks, and you'll see that in a couple of examples coming up. And then an ion, specifically a cation, so there's a positive charge, and here you see a cation, and a radical are produced. Um, and what you are forming is a radical cation. So go ahead and copy this in your notes. And again, you can always stop the, the presentation. So what would a radical cation look like? There's more than one way of drawing it. But basically, if you think about, you know, the, there are, this line here stands for two electrons. And now, um, basically, this electron here, it comes in and it knocks out one of those electrons and that's where you get the positive charge so that would put a positive charge here but there's another formula that i want you to fill in here um, and this is also explained in your textbook plus uh, a reminder again that 
um, you know, I did post uh, a handout. Um, the notes are going to um, also post it, but please work through it first. Try to analyze the spectra and then compare it to the notes that I'm uploading onto e-learning. Um, the co most common method of ionizing molecules is called EI. Um, so again, we're bombarding a molecule with a beam of high energy electrons. And really, beam of electrons here, uh, so one comes in and really then two actually come out uh, of here. Um, so if, we, if we're adding the electrons, so plus E plus, so if the way or plus E minus, I'm sorry, as I've done it here, right? So it's that electron beam that is now, instead of having two electrons that are represented in a line here, a carbon-carbon bond, now we only have one, and there's a positive charge. So this is one way of drawing the radical cation, okay? Um, the mass of a radical cation is the same as the parent compound because an electron is just really uh, has a tiny, tiny mass, so we're not going to see anything substantial in the spectrum there. If the radical cation remains intact, which is not always true, sometimes we don't see it because it is so unstable, it just falls apart. Um, but if, if it remains intact on the time scale and under the conditions uh, under which the spectrum is taken, um, you get a molecular ion, uh, which is referred to as M, or M plus dot, or we also call it parent ion. So most um, uh, spectra are identified by its molecular ion, uh, M or M plus or M plus dot. So again, there's a, there's a little bit of variation here. So one electron goes in, and then two electrons come out, uh, and you have one positive component and one negative component, because ultimately when this bombardment of electrons happens, uh, the molecules are not stable and fall apart into other components. So um, here, introduction to mass spectrometry. So radical cations typically fragment into radical and cations. So um, we can draw, this is this half hook or half barred arrow. It can be drawn to the left. It can also be drawn to the right. In this case, it doesn't make a, a difference because there's symmetry in the structure. But the way is, is it written here, so you see you have it in a square bracket. Uh, you can draw a line here and put the dot here, or you show the single electron have a, have a cation here. So please take a close look. We have to pay a lot of attention to detail as we're working through Orgo 2. Um, but anyway, so now we have the radical character on the left-hand side and the cation character on the right-hand side. Uh, we can also use generic terms like AB dot plus. So see, this is just a little bit different now. Now I've, we've drawn the bond, but we, we know that an electron is missing, that is a positive charge. So in general terms, this can go either to the left, then we have the radical character here, or if it goes to the right, then we have the radical character on the right, and then the corresponding cation. Again, we can only detect the cation in the, um, in the spectrophotometer, uh, but since it goes, you know, in, in both ways, eventually we'll detect the cation on this side and the cation on the other side. Um, the ions are then deflected in a magnetic field, and then you can actually determine this according to the mass to charge ratio. Um, neutrally charged fragments, radicals, are not detected. As I said, we're only measuring the cations, right? So only these are shown in the spectrum uh, after detection. On the next slide, we have a simple example. So the mass spectrum shows the relative abundance. Okay, so there's a whichever is uh, the tallest or the most uh, is going to be called the base peak. So this is an arbitrary assignment. So this is always going to be at a hundred percent for the base peak. Okay, uh, so here you go. Uh, this is for methane. It's a very simple molecule. Um, so we're looking at relative abundance, and you can see that there is something that's a little bit higher and then something smaller. So we see often clusters, and do not try to assign every single peak. We really just want to look at the main peaks, and mass spectrometry is far more uh, sophisticated. We're only learning some of the most basic components. So for methane, the base peak is the parent ion, um, uh, which is M or M 
uh, plus dot or m dot plus. Um, so again, one electron goes in, okay, it knocks out one of these bonding electrons, and then two electrons come out. Now we have the molecular ion or the radical cation, yeah, very important jargon we learn about. Um, and then, of course, this can fragment into other components. Moving on. So peaks with, uh, with a mass to charge ratio less than m plus represent fragments. So here we have it. So if the electron is knocked out, we have an overall positive charge. Now the radical character can go to the right to get the hydrogen, but it could also go to the left to then get the, the methyl uh, radical. Um, and uh, here's the fragment as we're taking away an electron from carbon that now carries the positive charge. So we see now the molecular ion at uh, 16 and then the fragment that is missing one for hydrogen one gram per mole, so that's 15. Um, and um, uh, so you can actually abstract and get some really wild uh, intermediates. So you can also see additional losses and you see 12, 13 and 14 uh, in here as well. Um, now, the presence of a peak that is m plus 1 can be explained because we have two main isotopes for carbon. So there is a carbon 12 isotope that we are showing here, or m, and then there is a carbon 13 that we refer to as m plus 1. Um, in the next slide here, um, just some general approaches. Again, you can always go back and or pause the presentation. But um, mass spectrometry, MS, is really very, very important in so many other areas of uh, pharmaceuticals, biotech, clinical, environmental application. If we're looking for contaminations, uh, water quality, um, geological, forensic, many, many more. And I should say this also includes uh, when you go or through the detector at an airport, uh, they might pull you to the side and they actually use mass spectrometers to look for any trace amounts. Uh, if you have unusually high amounts of nitrogen in the mix, uh, then often uh, 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 personnel is concerned about uh, uh, basically uh, some explosives. All right, uh, looking at uh, analysis of a mass spectrometer, uh, uh, of a mass spectrum, um, so here we have benzene, okay, and uh, it turns out that uh, the base peak is actually the uh, radical cation that is formed. Again, the base peak is the one that's going to be the tallest, so that's this one here, okay. And um, uh, now it turns out that this doesn't easily fragment, there are other reasons for this, but we need to understand that Fragmentation depends on the stability, or um, I'm sorry, this should be of uh, the ion or the radical that is being formed. Um, so we need to understand what the molecular weight is and what the first of all what, what the molecular formula is. So of course this is C6, so with six carbons, and then we have hydrogens that we don't have to show. Okay, but it's C6H6, so you uh, have six and then six times twelve. So you can then calculate what the mass should be. And I'm also telling you here, you already have, so this one here would then be your uh, M plus one peak uh, because of the uh, carbon-13 isotope. All right, so for most of the compounds, um, the radical cation that is initially formed is not uh, the base peak, often because it can fragment into more stable ions or radicals. So we're always going to get a cation and a radical. Um, now, when we're looking at pentane, which here you have a skeletal drawing of it, uh, it shows other pieces. Okay, so again, you want to figure out the formula. So we have um, we have five carbons, and we have three, five, seven, nine, and then another three hydrogens. So you got to figure out the molecular formula, some simple math here. Uh, and then you can see 
where the different components are. But you now see that the base peak here is actually somewhere else, right? So you, you need to count. So 40, 41, 42, 43. Wow, what could 43 be? Um, and uh, there are some common fragments that appear, especially with simple alkanes. The other things I want to mention here is that as we're looking at the fragmentation pattern, remember a, that when that first electron is, uh, uh, is cut out, that uh, basically, I'm going to zoom in here a little bit, we can cut or we can see a fragmentation here or here or here or here, right? Uh, now, some of them, uh, you can see the um, you know, some of the fragments are going to be identical, whether you're on the on the right hand side uh, breaking the carbon carbon bond or the left hand side because of symmetry here. But this is one way of how chemists often draw fragmentation patterns. Okay, uh, something else we want to understand is um, we need to uh, identify what our radical cation is in the spectrum. Um, the mass to charge ratio of the parent ion is the molecular mass of the compound. If you don't have the molecular formula, if you don't understand the skeletal drawing, then it's going to be an issue. And that's why I encourage everybody to look at, at foundational chapters and especially molecular drawing that were discussed in Orgo 1. If you have an odd uh, uh, parent ion, uh, then it means we have an odd number of nitrogen atoms because nitrogen atoms have a better, uh, a different um, uh, bonding pattern in the molecule. Um, even mass uh, um, parent ions um, usually, usually means the absence of nitrogen or an even number of nitrogen. And here are some examples, right? So here's pentane, molecular weight is 72, even number no nitrogen, right? Um, if we turn pentane into a butyl amine, now we have a different bonding pattern. Um, uh, we have nitrogen is trivalent, yeah? And so now, now we have an odd number uh, within the structure of 73. But if we were to introduce two nitrogens, now we have an even number. And this is also known as the nitrogen rule, and you, you can practice this with the conceptual checkpoint. All right, let's go back to this M plus 1 peak. So for methane, this is M plus 1 peak. Uh, it's because there's 1%, um, that is about 1% of the, uh, as abundant as the, uh, um, the molecular ion, the parent ion. So, and if we count, this is very easy. We have carbon, which is 12. 13, 14, 15, 16. And here it is. We see 16. That also happens to be our base peak. But we also see this one here. So this is now our M plus 1, right? So we want to be able to detect this. And what this comes down to is to the two isotopes that we know of. 99% of all carbon atoms are the isotope uh, C12. 1% of all carbon atoms are uh, from the isotope C13, and that is our M plus 1, okay? I know there are a lot of different symbols here, but you need to work and apply this jargon. So the more carbon atoms in a compound, the more the abundant the M plus 1 peak will be. So you can simply look at the ratio. So high, how, how is this, and high, how is... <laughs> How high is, are these two peaks relative to each other? So in decane, which has 10 carbons, you're going to see a much higher intensity, and that's about 10%. Okay, so that makes sense. Um, and again, you can practice this with Skill Builder. Okay, moving on. Um, now, it is possible to also see M plus 2 peaks. Uh, we can see this with sulfur. Um, uh, with sulfur containing compounds, um, but let's go to the for the more obvious ones. So the first one I want to discuss is chlorine. Chlorine has two abundant isotopes, and the ratio is roughly three to one. So you have a chlorine 35, okay, and then you have a chlorine 37. What's the difference? Two, and that's where that two comes from, okay. So the compounds containing a chlorine atom have an approximate three to one ratio. Guess what? Here's something that looks like 
one, two, this one here is the three, this is the one, and it's an M and to M plus two. That's a telltale sign you're going to have a chlorine in there, and that ratio matters. And then you can again see certain clusters. Uh, if you were to subtract uh, 35 from the overall molecular weight, again, you need to understand molecular formula and how to calculate molecular weight. Um, you can then subtract 35, and then you can estimate how many carbons could be in their maximum. Uh, but there's another tool that we'll learn on in the third part of this chapter, which has to do with hydrogen deficiency index. Okay, here's another example for an M plus 2. So again, chlorine and then bromine are the most common one. And look at the ratio. The 79 isotope is 51%. The 81, what's the difference between 79 and 81? That's 2 about 49 percent so we're looking at a one oops and somehow the two didn't go in there so this is almost a one to one ratio uh, because they're roughly equivalent and look this is almost an equal weighting of m and m plus two you the bell needs to go off and say aha there's got to be a bromine in there i mean right now you were given some of the structures but you may only be given a molecular formula or other other um, information absent the structure where you have to figure out and put the pieces of the puzzle together. Okay, so how do we analyze the fragments? Um, you do uh, a thorough analysis of all molecular fra fragments um, that will then give you structural information. Again, here we have pentane, right? So I said we can cut here, we can cut here, and then the other other two are, uh, are equivalent, really. Um, so you're going to have to figure out if this is M plus dot, right? So that's at 72. And then you have to think about, well, if I now look at the difference from 72 to this peak here, which seems to be a little bit higher, right? So we go from here to here. Uh, that looks like an M minus 15. And M minus 15 means that's actually then a loss of, well, can you guess? Well, if we're, if we're making the cut on the side here, that would then be a loss of CH3, okay? So again, it's simple addition and subtraction. Uh, what does it take to go from here to here? Or we could even go from here to here. So there are really different ways of looking at the differences. But um, what we then often see is fragments. And if we're looking at the structure, so it's CH3, CH2, 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 CH3. So often we see a loss of methyl first and then more losses with addition of uh, uh, 14 because that is what a methyl unit looks like. I'm doing this with my tracker here rather than the pen. But uh, So what's the difference between uh, 15 and, and 29? That's the 14, right? So 14 stands for a methyl unit that is being lost here. So I'm sorry, a loss of... CH2, which is a methylene, not a methyl. Pardon for misspeaking. Mis misspeaking. All right, moving on. So here you see in more detail how it breaks out. And you also have this in your chapter. So if we're cutting here, you're ending up with, with these two fragments. So this is now your M minus 15. Right. If we're losing another methylene group, as I said before, now it's M minus 29 because this C2H5 amounts to 29. Uh, this is the M minus 43, which is the loss of a propyl group. M minus 57, a loss of a butyl group. OK, so you need to be able to assign uh, the weights to this. So we see methyl, ethyl, propyl butyl loss. And then we can swap this. We could draw again the same thing here, uh, radical character here, 
and then cationic character here, which is really equivalent to what you see down here. Okay, so you need to understand some of the basic fragmentations. So as we're cutting in all these, but these are the two most significant ones. Uh, and so we, we can see these clusters, right? Of course, there's symmetry in the structure. Okay, cation stability does matter. And that is another reason why I wanted you to thoroughly review uh, the foundational chapters, because many of these skills are going to be paramount to succeed in this, in this class. Where fragmentation occurs um, to form new cations, the mode that gives the most stable cation is favored. So it means that we need to understand which cation is more stable or less stable. Methyl is the least stable, tertiallylic and benzylic the most stable. So this might remind you of the chapter for substitution reactions, uh, especially for uh, SN1, where cations were regularly formed. Okay, so ensure to understand how cation stability is ranked. Okay, and then the probabil probability of fragmentation to form new cations increases in the order that is shown here. Not so likely, but it can happen, more likely. So this might actually be one of your more stable uh, intermediates that forms, and they could then, the more stable something is, um, the more likely that that will become your base peak. If we're looking at a different fragmentation, so remember we had used just pentane. Now, if we had a different kind of derivative, uh, so here we have some um, um, substitution, and you know you can cut here, you can cut here, but uh, it looks like the favorite path that I'm going to draw in red here is going to happen in this position. Why? Because I can now put the radical or the cation character on a tertiary carbocation, right? So we need to understand that classification. And then here we have a primary. So this is going to be very, very stable. This could be a base peak. It's not always easy to predict that, but we have a strong correlation with cation stability. So while all possible fragments are po while all possible fragmentations are possible and observed, the most abundant fragment is the most stable cation possible. So we want to look for that. We want to be able to understand the base peak. Um, so in this in this example, as I said, the M minus 43, right? So you have C3, H7. That's going to be your 43 mass that you see in the spectrum. Uh, now it becomes a little bit more complex. We already covered uh, alcohols, so we're going to look at, at this one in more, more detail. Uh, alcohols generally undergo two main types of fragmentations. So there is uh, the alpha cleavage, and then there's also the dehydration. And um, alpha cleavage means that the alpha bond, so there are actually two alpha bonds, there's one on the left here and one on the right here. Um, but because there's more substitution here, it's shown like this now. And then also, um, this when we have a positive charge here, this is our oxonium ion. Um, so as we are looking at an alcohol, uh, let me just try to draw something on uh, my other device. Remember that an alcohol also has non-bonding electrons, okay? So it turns out that non-bonding electrons, it's easier to remove these um, in that electron beam, right? So you now see that here we have our ROH, one electron pair, and then only a single electron and a positive charge because the electron that was knocked out left a positive charge here, right? So that's why try to emphasize we're talking with an electron bombardment basically let me draw this electron in red okay that's being knocked out and uh, as we're looking at this um, the alpha cleavage means that this bond here is broken this is the alpha position so we can break here or here and we use the half bar arrow only moving one electron one electron goes here and then from this uh, line, which represents two electrons, we're now moving one of the electrons here, forming the double bond, okay? And then this component here becomes your R, 
CH2 dot, which you see over here. And as we now have formed the double bond after alpha cleavage, again, and this is the alpha position, uh, we see that we can actually draw a resonance form. Remember, this is the resonance arrow, and you should be very well versed in this because we're going to use resonance over and over again. All right, and then dehydration, as the name says, uh, it means loss of H2O. Uh, so loss of water, very easy. Uh, so this is not a mechanism, this is just simplified. But these two groupings disappear and you're forming a double bond here. Um, remember that this is a radical uh, cation and that character will still be there. And then what does water amount to? 18. One oxygen, uh, two hydrogen, 16 plus 2 makes 18. So simple math. Now amines, which we're going to uh, cover in a, in a few chapters, and I should have added the McLafferty rearrangement already, uh, you should start practicing this. It's gonna it's gonna show up again with um, in in a few chapters, especially with ketones um, and aldehydes. So let's start off with the amines. They can also undergo alpha cleavage. Here's your alpha position. Okay. Uh, again, we're breaking this here. It's very similar. Remember that um, in an amine. So let me pick a different color here. Um, if we have N H two, and then I'm just going to say another placeholder R. Remember, there's a free electron pair here. So again, one high energy electron comes in, and then it knocks out the non-bonding electron. They're easier to remove, um, and then we see. Uh, how this alpha position, we're doing the fragmentation at this bond, it looks really the same. Where this is knocked out as a positive charge, one electron is now going to be used for making the double bond, uh, but we need still the electron from this bond here. So here you have your double bond. And then uh, the other component is the radical, because this one electron is moving towards this CH2 group, RCH2 dot. And then again, we can have resonance stabilization. And that's one of the reasons why this is a common fragmentation pattern. Okay, now for uh, carbonyl compounds, and they're coming our way fast, there's this named rearrangement, McLafferty rearrangement. Uh, and what you need to learn is we have an alpha, beta, gamma position, and the hydrogen in the gamma position plays a role because one of these electrons is going to form a bond to the oxygen. Remember, we had knocked out one of the electrons here. Now, half hook arrow moving one electron, another one here. Guess what? Now we have a new bond over here. The charge stays the same. Uh, and then we're taking the, remember, so these lines stand for two electrons. So we want to understand this formalism. One electron moves down here and then from this one here, we're going to have half hook arrow forming a double bond here. And there you are. You have a double bond. Okay. And then uh, here uh, we are generating another radical. And that's how you end up with this structure here. And then this can rearrange. Uh, we can now form a resonance form. Again, half barred arrow. This can make a double bond. But we need to take one electron from this line here and then the other line quench, uh, goes up to the oxygen. Okay, uh, So you form a double bond here, uh, which is drawn here. So this requires some practice, but if you know your mechanism formalism, you'll do just fine. If you need to practice this, go back to some of the foundational chapters uh, and look at some uh, uh, examples or do additional reading. So analyzing the fragments, again, you can pause and take this in, but we've already talked about common fragments. So 15 is the methyl group, and then we typically deal with increments of 14, right? So we add 14, 14, 14, and then here loss of water, especially from an alcohol. And then here, um, 
and this is often x is often an even number um, especially for when we get to ketones and aldehydes and you have another conceptual checkpoint where you can practice Lastly, I just want to mention that there's also something known as HIRES mass spec. Um, there's yet another acronym for this. Uh, what it means is that we can go to uh, several decimal points. That's how sensitive these instruments are. If we're thinking about carbon, that is exactly 12.5. 0, 0, 0, 0 AMU atomic mass units. Um, it's based on that. And then we can actually differentiate of diff with different groupings. For your purposes, I mean, the most important part is hydrogen is 1, carbon is 12, but we can, we can uh, use the abundance and now if we have high sensitivity, sensitivity, we can notice the difference. Here are two examples. Here's a ketone, here's a cyclohexane, clearly carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, here only carbon and hydrogen. If we just do our rounding calculation, they both are at 84, but with high-res mass spec, high-resolution mass spectrometry, we get 84.0573 versus 84.0936. Okay. So this concludes the first part, and then there are only a few slides left to understand hydrogen deficiency index, and I'll see you in that video.